Uh, yeah, so my name is Holly Clark. Uh, I'm a young child. I've been working in the games industry for over 12 years. Uh, and I come from an animation background. My first job in the industry was um, actually as a tester. I went to QA and I was testing video games. And I got uh, my first full time job as a junior animator. And I worked up through the industry, I became a senior animator, and eventually became a manager. And then I started making games myself. And then uh, uh, teamed up with some people, some great people, and set up a company, which is Modern Dream. Uh, at the end of last year, I was very fortunate to be selected as a BAFTA Breakthrough Brit, uh, which is it's a reward, it's an award, but it's also uh, it's a sense of responsibility. I mean, BAFTA is a very prestigious organisation, and it's it's, uh, it's been a privilege to be a part of it, and something that I've taken on as something to live up to. Uh, I was I'm always pushing, always learning, and uh, that initiative gave me a, gave me a kick of the ass and said, right now you've really got to live up to it. So uh, the kind of games that I've uh, been working on as part of Bond Dream. The first game we released was the Cat We Got The Milk, and we put that together as a free to download game. And the inspiration for that came from going around galleries, going around art galleries, and saying, wow, there's so much great stuff in here. Why don't you just steal it and make a video game out of it? Put it out and see what happens. Um, it went down really well. People love it. And we still get lots of emails today. Lots of people play it on YouTube, and lots of videos go up. So it got us. That game itself goes thinking, well, actually, maybe we can make a go of this. Maybe there's nothing stopping us but us. So let's, let's just try it out. So we moved on to uh, The Button Affair, this game. That one we released uh, to raise money for a great charity called Special Effect to help uh, gamers who are disabled play video games. Um, and their aim is to improve quality of life. So it was great to be involved in them and to put that game out. And it was inspired by the art style from Mad Men, Side On Runner, very straightforward, um, but a lot of fun to do, and a lot of people enjoyed that one. Now, we came to do another game, which was going to be another abstract game, a bit like The Cat That Got The Milk, but the studio we were working for at the time uh, went into liquidation. And at the same time, they had the, uh, uh, the award for uh, BAFTA Breakthrough, and I thought, well, right, I've got to live up to this, what am I going to do? So the guys I was working with um, at the time, uh, we were working on Typing the Dead with uh, Sega, so I just went to the guy and said, look, I'm going to try and set up, a, set up a small studio, and we're going to finish this game for Sega. And uh, we went and met with Sega, and they said, Okay, you can do it. Like, really? Yes. Okay, off we go. So we, we had the chance to work on work with a great IP, which is Typing the Dead. And if you're not familiar with the game, it's uh, essentially you type words to kill zombies. A very simple mechanic, but the beautiful thing about it is that everyone can type pretty much, and the game is asking you to type well. And on that basis, uh, you give them lots of feedback on killing zombies. It's a wonderful game to play. And the, we were over the moon with how well it was received. Um, it was trending on, on the day it was released on Twitter. And we thought, wow, this is, this is amazing. And so um, we started to look at uh, what to do next. And for the past year, we've had this philosophy that we've been following to develop our, our latest game, LA Cops, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, so we develop games that grab the eyes. We want art styles that you can't walk past. You'll see an image of it and go, what's that? That looks interesting. And you want to know more about it. Want, because there's so much entertainment out there. You've got to stand out. You've got to be doing something interesting. So the best way to do it is partly with colour. I'll talk about that in a bit. And to combine it with fun gameplay, with the kind of games that are just fun. I mean, there are free-to-play games out there. There are games that are developed by statistics. We're focused on making sure that games that we make, people will have fun playing them. That is the core thing. We make experiences that people will enjoy. That's, that's the core of what we do. It's as simple as that. We make experiences that people enjoy. Uh, we're highly skilled. I mean, we've all got plenty of experience, worked in the industry for a long time. We've taken those skills and worked out how to become cost effective as part of Modern Dream. We've, we've reduced all our fixed costs and made sure that we're working with people on a, on, a, on a very fair, very well paid basis, but we don't have huge buildings that we're paying for. We work as part of the Arch Creatives. Um, what is the Arch Creatives? It's our co-working space. So when we were setting up Modern Dream, we said, all right, we could have a big studio, but then we've got uh, IT, admin, but technology's moved on. We all have laptops now, which are connected to the internet via Gmail. There's, there's all our email sorted out. We have Dropbox or uh, Google Drive to sort of store all our documentation. It's all secure. It's as secure as anything can be these days. So actually, all we need is a space where we can sit down, put our laptops, have a bit of broadband, and work. But we don't want to work from home. It would be good if we were working with other people doing the same thing. So in the Arch Creatives, um, there are three game teams. This is our opening event. Uh, we formed up a community of around 170 game developers, and we hold socials uh, pretty much every other month. 
and we get about 60 people that come along. Our whole group uh, of developers is about 170 people. So we've got a good community of people flowing through it, which is kind of exciting. It's fun. It's great working with other game developers. And our aim is to put smart people in a smart room and have great games come out. It's as simple as that. I mean, we're all creatives. We're all problem solvers. We're looking for new ways to do new things. And we just need to facilitate people doing that. So we keep it very simple. You've just got your table, your chair, your broadband, your coffee. Come in, sit down, get working, and occasionally get talking. You share an idea, you get feedback on it. All you need to do is put smart people in a room. And that's our philosophy with the, uh, the Arch Creators. And there you can see that's us on a work day. This is the same place we were having the party. Essentially, these tables are on trestles that we can move to the side, and everyone can just hang around, have a few drinks. We've got a, a back wall there which we can project games on or videos or whatever we're doing at the time. So the space is flexible. We're, adaptability is key to us in, a, in an industry where the technology is changing every six months. I mean, the, the latest iPhone 6, people are saying that's around the same performance as a PlayStation 3. And a PlayStation 3 is a great console. You can do fantastic games on that, and it's getting all the more powerful every year. So we need to be adaptable, and that's represented in the, uh, the way the space is laid out. Uh, so the aim of the Arch is to get great products to market, to be competitive with each other, but to cooperate at the same time, which is, uh, I mean, that, that's a juxtaposition, but we're competitors in that we're trying to get better and better and better, and we're looking at what the others are doing, saying, oh, that's interesting, how did you do that? Yeah, we did it like that. Okay, I'm gonna try and do that better. So it's a kind of friendly competition. And it's adaptability, as I've uh, talked about already. And again, another shot of us just hanging out, just, just working. Uh, <coughs> we also have people come along, uh, like uh, we, this is uh, when we had Sony come along and talk about their platform, how to get games made on there. And we just say, you're always welcome to just come along and hang out. If you see we're having a talk or, so or something, or you want to come along for a social night, you're more than welcome to come along. It's free. Um, to use the space on a, on a basis, well, it's a non-for-profit organization. You, we just charge uh, 10 pounds to use it for a day or 120 a month. So the, the space is uh, self-sustaining. It's just there to facilitate us making games. So that's the Arch Creatives. The game we're making, uh, we're one of the studios in Arch, Arch Creatives, Modern Dream. The game we're making is LA Cops. You remember what I talked about earlier, just about having something that grabs the eyes? That's what we're trying to do with this. We're trying to just bright, vibrant, colorful, very clear what it is. It's about cops, and you can guess it's pretty much about shooting stuff. It's a, it's a top-down shooter. Um, so the core of this, when we were developing it at the, the beginning of the year, beginning of since January, was to take the classic gameplay of uh, Bullfrog's Syndicate. Has anyone played Syndicate? It's quite an old game. The Sorry? The original of the remake. The original. Yeah. So you have um, four agents that you can control and move around the screen, and then you upgrade them as you go through the game. So it's a similar kind of principle and gameplay of that. In our game, you have two cops, which you can upgrade as you play through it. Again, we want that bright, eye-grabbing art style. We want people to look at it and go, oh, what's that, and get interested in it. And uh, we've got uh, the theme of it is 70s cops doing a tough job in a tough town. So we've taken a lot of inspiration from shows like TJ Hooker or um, Cagney and Lacey uh, from the early 80s or Starsky and Hutch. He's going to play the video? No? Is it going to go? It's dusky, it might be a bit. Uh, your audience might be a bit young for that. Possibly. Yeah, it's true, but it's, uh, it's, it's such a rich seam of entertainment there. It's always look for things that um, haven't been done for a while and reinvigorate them and come at them with a new angle. Uh, I'm just going to have a, see if I can get this video to play. I might have to do a. Mm, that's not going to work either. Um, it's on a. Is, is this on the internet? Yeah, yeah, that's on. If I just do that. There we go. It'd be great to see the video because it kind of gets across the theme, how the game plays, just in, in a minute's worth of video. I'd love to get it working.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nir, for saving us. Um, yeah, so that's LA Cops. Uh, more than welcome to look it up, or uh, if you've got any questions, you can come up and find me after afterwards. So uh, inspiration and design, this is what I want to talk about today. I've got a short Google link there, so you're more than welcome to have a look at uh, these slides later on and drop me an email if you have any questions. Um, what I want you to take away from what I'm talking about today is that creative people are broad people. Creativity is breadth. I'll explain why. So uh, around 2006, I was a, uh, a game studio. I was an animator. I was thinking, OK, I'm doing my dream job. I'm having a good time. And then I saw Gobeland Studios. Is anyone familiar with, this, with these guys? Seen their animations? Yeah, I wasn't either. It's well worth looking up, because if you look at the quality of what they produce, it's utterly fantastic. The, uh, the uh, composition, the colors, the style, all the design, it's amazing. It's, it's like the bar that you have to reach. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, God, this is, this is brilliant. And then someone said, yeah, they're all students. I was like, what? They're students? <laughs> I, was, I was just like, OK, I know nothing. I'm back to square one. And that's a very important lesson to take away with you, is that we're always learning. We're always trying to get better. And we should always be looking out for who is better and just broadening our horizons all the time. And uh, I was talking to a guy who was um, Swiss, I think, and uh, he had some familiar with, familiarity with the guys who were on the course and uh, how they did it. And he said to me, first, they teach them to be artists, and then they teach them how to use the tools. So there's uh, an ethos there of understanding the core of art, the mysteries of, of art, and how all that works. And that got me, that really got my imagination. It just opened a door and just said, there's a whole world in here I know nothing about. So I just thought, right, I'm going through that. I'm going to find out as much as I can. And um, this image... Uh, the true artist uh, helps the world by revealing mystic truths. Uh, I love the way that he's, he's summed that up in this kind of uh, uh, these two colours that just don't work together. It creates a tension in the image. It's Bruce Nauman from 1967. It's just one of the images that just opened a door. I just thought, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. You can, you can do something like that. Um, so to be broad, you need to be curious. You need to be asking questions about everything all the time. Why is this part of the blue carpet blue? Why is that part red? Why has it been laid out that way? It's not just random. There's a reason why that's happened. You need to be looking around all the time and asking why everything is the way it is. Um, so first, we're going to look at the art, and then we're going to look at how it's executed in the game that I showed you earlier, LA Cops. And so thinking of artists, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, everyone knows him. He's very, very famous. But he was curious about everything. He didn't just think of himself as an artist, he thought of himself as a, as a scientist. Uh, he got involved in politics of one sort or another. He was doing all sorts of things. He was curious about everything. He was curious about how the body was put together. And at the time, that was, this was really revolutionary thinking. You know, most people at the time were just, I mean, there's a, there's a saying that we get more information every single day than the person in the 1700s did in their lifetime. So he was a revolutionary thinker in how he approached things. And he was, he was one of the first people to be really curious about everything. So here's a question. How many colors can we see? You ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered how many colors? And the answer is quite interesting, actually. On average, we can see about 10 million. But it's not the same for everyone. Some people can see more than that. In fact, I read an article recently suggesting that some people have a particular genetic mu mutation that they can see 100 million colors, and those are in the variations between green and red, generally. So there are some people out there that can see more colors than most of us can. And then when you think about colors, how do you describe a color? What, what color is fire and red? What does that even mean? It's different to everyone. It's subjective. How many frames per second can we see? Anyone know that one? Anyone want to take a, be brave and take a guess? It's flicker fusion. Flicker, flicker fusion frequency is around 72 frames a second. So yes, 24 is often the answer that people give because that's what uh, films were uh, played at. So films, they they were running um, film through a, um, a a camera, and the fastest they could do it was 24. Any less than that was kind of a bit bitty. But uh, the way they're doing it is blurring together. If they, if they ran it any faster, the kind of film they were using at the time would, would burst into flames. And there were often a lot of accidents. And, and you know, people were, if you ever see the film Cinema Paradiso, there's a sequence where the, the camera bursts into flames and the guy's blind and it's all horrible. Uh, so that was why it's, it was, it's been 24 frames a second for, for so long, just because of technological limitations. But the, the, number of frames that, or the number of frames that blur together and we can't see anymore is actually 72. 
So a lot of games actually run at 30 frames per second, but our screens that we have these days can display uh, images at 60 frames a second. And it's something that often you don't see, you're not aware of it, but you feel it. Uh, that video I showed you there uh, was running at 30 frames per second. If you see the game, it's running at 60 frames per second. It feels a lot more tangible, particularly in games. With film, you can get away with it because you're passive. You're sat there with games. You feel it, it particularly in things like uh, Twitch games, like uh, first-person shooters or racing games. You want that 60 frames per second. And just through asking questions like this, you become aware of what people are experiencing. Remember what I said? It's all about creating experiences. And you just got to understand what people are experiencing and ask questions about it and say, oh, they're experiencing that. What happens if we up the frame rate to 60 frames per second? How does it feel? It feels a lot better is the answer. Uh, what resolution is our eyesight? Um, how many pixels can we see? Uh, 576 megapixels or 30 times more than a high definition TV. And I, just for an experiment, I, I put that out in, in Photoshop and it's 32,000 by 18,000 pixels. The, the, we've never seen a screen like that. The technology doesn't exist yet, but it's on its way. Um, so a couple of years ago, well, oh, actually 2013, I put this together and you can see all the Apple devices up until that point, what resolution they are. So you can see the iPhone 3GS up in the top corner. That's the, that's the um, correlated resolution with something like a MacBook Retina display. You can see the utter difference there. The, and that's the difference of canvases. You think about painting, what size canvas it's on. It's a radical difference. And if you're developing a game, where are you targeting it? And that has an effect on how your composition is going to be laid out, uh, the resolution of the images on there. I mean, there are always legendary stories of game studios from the past. They would create a, a 2048 by 2048 texture resolution of, a, of a, an arrowhead, which on the screen would be about that big. Be aware of uh, your, your canvas, what technology you're using, and how you can make the most out of it. Um, cameras, be aware of cameras. Uh, what are the standard resolutions? Now, you got video CD there, going to DVD, going to 720p, so the 720p is uh, kind of PS3, Xbox 360 resolution. Now we're on to the next generation of consoles. They're largely 1080p, so you can see the difference there. And 2K has been coming in, and 4K resolution monitors are coming out. You can pick up a 4K one, I think, for about a, a thousand pounds now, and they're, they're coming down rapidly in price. So this is rapidly becoming the norm. And I was just reading about IMAX that are coming out, it'll be 5K. And the difference in quality there, if you get a chance, go into somewhere like uh, Kares or PC World, and they have these screens there, and watch the video footage, and watch something, they have uh, video footage of films like uh, Pacific Rim and The Hobbit, and feel the difference in that. It's quite radical. It's, it's, for me, it's a bigger <coughs> effect than going to something like stereoscopic 3D. It's well worth just asking questions, just being aware of that, having a look, experiencing it yourself. Yeah, so if we compare that 4K with our human eyesight, again, it's a radical difference, but technology is moving on exponentially. How long is it going to be before we get there? I don't honestly know, but I don't think it will be that long, and it will certainly be within our lifetimes. So, Alicops, how does it apply to uh, what we're doing there? So, Alicops, the ideas themselves and how it looks, it comes from art. Going back to the cat that got the milk, I was going around that gallery and I thought, there's some great ideas here. Why don't I steal them? I mean, why don't I understand what's happening in these, these images and just see if we can make a game out of it? So this is a painting by David Hockney called uh, A Bigger Splash, and it's in the 1960s. It's, it's after the war, the, the great tragedy, and uh, rationing is coming to an end, particularly in the United States, and they're becoming the world's superpower. There's a real sense of optimism, brightness, and I thought it was a great contradiction, uh, um, juxtaposition with uh, the last generation of, of games like Gears of War, which are all great games, but they're all brown, they're all grey. And to stand out in a competitive marketplace, you want to do something different. And I thought, well, we can see 10 million colours. Why don't we see if we can find something bright and vibrant and render it on the screen and see how people go for that. And so far, it's been great. People have really responded to it and gone, oh, that is different. That's refreshing. That's bright. I like the optimism. Um, so the amount of data if you're going through the, what was it, 576 megapixel images that are going into your brain, they're not literally going into your brain, but that's the kind of amount of data we're dealing with, is about 1.61 gigabytes of raw data. How does your brain deal with that? The answer is I don't think anyone really knows, and I think that's something that we're working out now. Uh, but if you think about that, something a bit simpler is a bit easier on the brain. It's quite stressful, the amount of information we're subjected to every single day from our phones, from our computers, from all the advertising that's dreaming at us all day everywhere. Why not just make it a bit simpler, a bit, a bit easier on, the, on, your, on, your, uh, on your players? 
Uh, this is another image, uh, Edward Rusker's Stand Aside. Again, it's that kind of like an optimism, bright, it's the, uh, it's the American dream. Um, it's, it's, again, it's that, that when America is coming to its fore, and it's all fueled by the gasoline station. You can see the bright colors, the strong compositions. It's just appealing, it's nice. So uh, I took that image and just made this guy up, 70s cop, rendered it, it's something similar to our previous game, The Button Affair, put it together, put it into a pitch, and I went to some investors and said, want to make this? And they said, wow, I really like it, let's go for it. It really was as simple as that. But it just comes from understanding what I'm looking at, putting simple ideas together, and seeing what new, what new things come out. There are very few new ideas in the world. It's often just taking something, oh, that was really good. Yeah, that was really good too. What happens if we put them together? What happens there? Quite often it's rubbish, and no, that wouldn't work. But sometimes you come up with something and you go, oh, that actually works, that's appealing. And that's all it's really about. Uh, so it's effectively simple, it's optimistic, and it grabs attention. We've got our core theme, our core experience, our core feel for the game. Um, so now we understand what we're looking at. Let's see how we get the tools to do what we want to do. It's much easier to work that way around. It's, it's, it's great to learn the tools, and you have to do that. It's very, very important, but it's much easier to come up with a compelling comp concept if you know what you're looking at in the first place. Okay, it's much easier to get the technology to do what you want it to do. So how are we going to do that? The, the game Alicops is in development with Maya LT, which is a very low-cost 3D um, piece of software. That I mean, I, my background, I started in 3D Studio. I learned Maya. The Maya LT came along. I compared the feature list with Maya and Maya LT, and I thought, okay, Maya LT has got all the bits I want. Maya has all the bits I want, plus some video and post-production features that I will never use. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper. You can go on a monthly subscription or uh, just buy it outright. I'll go for that. I'll use that tool. And people thought I was crazy at the time. I used to get some strange tweets at me, sort of saying, really? You're going to use that? That's not a professional standard. Was, Actually, it is. Never listen to other people. Look at, use your own brain. Make your own decisions, because it's certainly been working out well for us. We also use Unity. We're, we paid for um, Unity Pro which, uh, with iOS, and that comes to about £1,500. However, Unity, as sure as you know, is free, and you can get making games in it straight away. Uh, which is using uh, Photoshop or um, Adobe software, which is pretty standard, so that doesn't look like changing. It's a great piece of software to learn how to use. Um, Illustrator um, is um, yeah, great for vector art. We've got a very um, flat shader style, so we used a lot of vector art. Uh, we use Zara. Uh, not only is it a lot cheaper, but personally I prefer it. I think it's a lot more straightforward. I can get my ideas out without fiddling around with some strange um, interface issues that I think Illustrator has. But that's purely my opinion. Um, so the pipeline. Now, hopefully you're familiar with uh, the general pipeline of how assets go, but I'll run through it. You've got your concept uh, that you're making up. How are we doing for time, am I? Three minutes, right. I'm going to chop through this. Uh, so you've got your concept, going to model, UV unwrap, texture, you bring it, animate, export, populate, make an script, build, get it, test it. You've literally got to go through all that to get your assets in there. Um, you've got all your modeling, you've got to get, make sure you've got your topology right, uh, need deformation, make sure it uh, deforms correctly. Uh, do I really need to start from scratch these days? No, you don't. You can just buy a model that meets all that criteria. It's important to understand it, but you don't need to keep redoing it. There, is there are wonders on the internet, there's plenty of resources out there to just go and buy a model. Uh, you modify it, and you can make it look like that. Pretty straightforward. That is a 3D model running in Maya LT. And I started putting the concepts together to, again, look at the experience that I'm trying to get across. The feeling of this guy's isolation. There's something wrong with him, but he's, he's kind of on his own. Uh, again, just get it into 3D, just see how that feels. Um, so again, looking at this pipeline, do I really need to do all that? Think about it. That's what I want. Do I need to do all that? Do I need to do UV unwrapping? Nope. You can see all the red issues there. There's basically parts I've cut out of the pipeline. Those are all necessary steps if I want to do a Gears of War character. But for me, for, for the style of game I'm looking at, not actually necessary. Just saved a ton of work there, but I'm still getting exactly what I want. Uh, the other characters follow exactly the same principles. Now I've got one, I can make lots of them very quickly and very easily. Uh, the rigging, again, MyRLT has uh, Human IK, which is great for getting characters rigged up, getting them animated in games. And um, yeah, you can see plenty of examples online there. I recommend having a look at their website and seeing how that works because you can get um, your own animations, you can get a character into game animating with other animations, not having to do your own first, get it all working, and then say, right, now it's all working, I can create my own anim animations over the top. The beauty of doing that is, when your programmer is saying, I need to do my prototypes, where are my assets? You can get going with it very quickly with a combination of human IK from MyRLT and Mixamo. 
It won't be exactly what you want, but at least you can feed the programmers whilst you work out what you do want. So, yeah, you can kind of see how just strip down the pipeline again because I know exactly what I wanted to do in the first place. I understood that. Color. Um, yeah, there's a whole other section here on, on color, which I'll have to go through very quickly. So this is a picture by Monet, and he understood that colors um, have complementaries, colors that go really well together and set images off. So there's something missing from this image. It's that sun. And that orangey, sort of red, reddish orange is really vibrating against that blue there. It's really standing out. It's capturing your attention. Color is a very powerful tool if you know how to use it. It's an incredibly complex subject, but if you know how to use it, it's very, very cheap to run on uh, any device, but it's incredibly powerful. Um, so I recommend looking at this tool, the Color Scheme Designer, and it will instantly, like, that color there that's pointed out there is the complementary of this color there. Now, if you put them together, it can be quite jarring, but if you put something in between just to balance it, you can create scenes that really stand out very, very cheaply in terms of performance and production. Uh, atmospheric perspective, uh, this is a Degas. He understood that some colors appear closer than others. Blues appear further away than reds, and he's, he's deliberately laid that out. It's not an accident. He knows what he's doing. So, for example, is this red square behind or on top of the blue. To pretty much all of us, it feels like that red square is on top of the blue. But it could be behind, couldn't it? it the, the artist here is sort of trying to trick us and say that you're looking into something, but it doesn't feel right. It's unsettling. And that's just because that's the way we're wired up. That's how wavelengths of colors work. Well worth going into and understanding. Um, and Photoshop understands that. The people that wrote that understand that. And they've laid out the program to help you um, take advantage of that, and you've got hue, saturation, brightness. Those three elements understand how to put color together based on those three criteria. The hue is here, the different kind of uh, colors that you've got. The saturation is how um, rich that color is. And then you've got the brightness, this value going up and down. Um, so colors here appear very far away. Colors here appear very close. That's not an accident. That's laid out that way deliberately. Again, be curious. Just be asking yourself, why is that that way? And find out. Um, could, could we go on, running out of time? But uh, in summary, question everything. If, if you take anything away today, just when you go home, why is your house laid out that way? Was it, are you living in a 1930s flat? There are reasons why that was laid out the way it was now. Why are modern flats laid out differently? Or if you're in halls, find out why. Um, questions, questions, questions. What color are shadows? They're not black. Colors are never, uh, shadows are never black. They're always a color that corresponds to the lighting around them. Um, yeah, creative people are broad people. Thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to wish you all good luck. Thank you.